Uh, we just showed a clip of uh, Senator Bernie Sanders talking with Bob Costa from uh, from Washington Post, and and he. Uh, was discussing how Sen- Senator Sanders, when he was nominated at the convention by AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, she was called out by NBC News for um, not saying Joe Biden's name. And it illustrated uh, an example of how NBC, which does know the DNC's rules of nomination, uh, tried to use the fact that, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did not say Joe Biden's name at the convention um, against her. And we were just discussing right beforehand, this is a perfect illustration of manufacturing consent in which the the corporate media surely knows how the DNC conventions work if they know anything, Um, but they still wanted to pit uh, progressives against centrists. So what do you think of that just from the start? Well, there's a clear conflict between the uh, Democratic convent, between the DNC, the Democratic National Council, and the... uh, liberal constituency. Uh, the, uh, you can see it in the debates over the program. Uh, also click the blue Add to Chrome button, then click Add Extension Uh-oh. to continue. Uh-oh, we have a little technical. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, we, we had a little bit of a technical glitch there. Uh, go ahead, keep going. Technical problem? There's a pop-up sound, but I think it passed now. I think so, yeah. Uh, so what happens when we're doing this from home? <laughs> so, so you're saying that there was a uh, there, there is a clear divide right now uh, well, between the progressives it, it, and the centers. Very clearly in the program. So, for example, the uh, the both uh, both uh, actually both Joe, even between Biden and the DNC. So Joe Biden and Kamala. Harris, both of them, each of them separately said that they wanted to uh, uh, have to end subsidies for fossil fuel companies. That was part of the Democratic Party program. When the DNC management saw it, they cut it out. They're thinking about uh, donors in uh, fossil fuel donors in Pennsylvania and Ohio. So they cut out the program of their own nominee, not just Sanders and AOC, Biden and Harris. They cut it out at the last minute. And they did it behind closed doors, which, um, you know, it happened behind the scenes. It didn't happen with a vote. Uh, it surely didn't happen in front of any cameras. And and it also happened while everybody was paying attention to this, this, uh, this I guess, well-crafted <laughs> uh, convention. So, I mean, I guess what we're trying to figure out right now is is if Joe Biden is elected and, and he uh, takes office and effectively he will take over the Democratic National Committee, are progressives going to be in worse shape in that the, the, the Democratic establishment, in terms of the movement pushing forward, the Democratic establishment will have the reins again. It's not like we're going to have an election over DNC chair anymore. Suddenly, it will be Joe Biden's party. Center for American Progress will be in, in power again. Uh, you know, all of the institutions that surround. How do you see this playing out? It's very hard to say. There's this. There, there's not only a Democrat Republican con- conflict. There's a conflict internal to the Democratic Party between the Clinton New Democrats, uh, donor oriented. Wall Street oriented, and the base of the party, which is uh, basically social democratic, wants uh, wants to move on issues like health care, uh, ending fossil fuels, so on. That's a conflict. Same one in the Labour Party in uh, England. In fact, the what you saw in England was a real power play when the parliamentary Labour Party, the Blair Party, uh, along with the media, mass media, almost uniformly, uh, really destroyed the popular Labour Party. They destroyed Corbyn, who had turned the Labour Party into a participatory party with mass popular involvement. They couldn't take that. They killed it. If you take a look at that uh, 800-page report that came out on 
shenanigans inside the Labour Party, you can see the extent to which they went to destroy the threat of a popular-based Labour Party. They wouldn't tolerate that, and they managed to destroy it, basically. And I think we're seeing something of the same conflict here. So, for example, the, the DNC and uh, where they control the states were able to purge Sanders voters. In 2016, they probably did it this time too. We haven't mm -hmm. got the figures yet, but now we see it even more sharply because it's even between the Clintonite DNC establishment and their own candidate. That's who's That's one of them actually, but went a little too far in uh, threatening the donor class. Uh, Professor Chomsky, um... about American elections. Mm -hmm. American elections are bought. You can predict the outcome of an election for Congress or president with remarkable precision by just looking at, at campaign funding. Uh, Thomas Ferguson, well-known political scientist, has studied this uh, over a century, and it's remarkably predictable. You have to laugh when people talk about uh, Russian uh, influence in the election, which is undetectable. Right. And what is not only detectable, but overwhelming, is simply the funding of elections by the corporate sector and private wealth. There is an overwhelming effect. You know, over the last uh, 45 years, since since the New Democrats and New Labor and, and really the consolidation of, of media, um, it's, it's been very hard for progressives to build a boom. And of course, it's all broken apart with, with the internet and um, income inequality soaring, and, you know, all the movements that have grown in the last uh, decade or so. So we, ha, have you been surprised by how long uh, the new Dems, the new labor have been able to stay around? Uh, you know, the, the Bill Clintons of the world maintaining their power well after their presidency and, and control of the White House and the party. They've pretty much controlled the same basic group has largely controlled the government since the country was founded. <laughs> That's taking different forms at different times. Now, when there is a an enormous popular upsurge of the kind that took place, say, in the 1930s, when the labor movement revitalized and massive strikes, uh, sit-down strikes, and uh, popular parties storming, demanding change, and a sympathetic administration, it, it, it yielded to their pressures. Then you got the New Deal, and the United States moved to a mild level of social democracy. Mm -hmm. To recognize how remote the United States is from the major uh, uh, developed societies, so take the Sanders program, uh, which is called in the press, Radical Left. <laughs> okay, this is a radical left program. Two main planks. One is universal health care. Can you think of another society that has universal health care? Can you think of one that doesn't have it? Exactly. But that's radical left in the United States. Really scary. The other major plank, there are only two, is free college tuition. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. But to call for what's everywhere in the United States is radical left. We have articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post saying, you know, maybe it's a good idea, but Americans just aren't ready for these radical left proposals that you have in every other country of the world. I mean, that's a sign of business power, enormous business power. Now, is the public opposed to universal health care? Of course not. Right. Take a look at, in fact, what happens when it comes up on the ballot is very interesting. So I lived most of my life in Massachusetts, the most liberal state. Uh, universal health care regularly came up on the state ballot, on the state for a referendum in the state. Polls showed 
overwhelming support for it. Then you start getting the flood of ads. They're going to take your doctor away from you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have such huge taxes, you won't be able to buy food, you know, poor and, you know, nice couples like Harry and Louise talking about how terrible our lives will be when we won't be able to see a doctor and the state will be controlling us and so on. You watch the polls, the numbers decline, and finally it gets to vote, it's voted down. That's business power, and you're not going to confront it inside the government. Only way you can confront it is by making people's power greater. Worked pretty well in England. 2017, Corbyn swept the elections, biggest uh, vote that, that Labour had ever gotten. Two years later, they killed him with uh, a massive campaign uh, claiming uh, anti Semitism. Right. You know, somebody said a critical word about Israel, they're Nazis, and so on. And it was all over the media, all the way to the to the Guardian, you know, the critical media. Right. And they, uh, he's not a fighter. He just stood there and took the battering, and there was no answer. That was it. Uh, you're seeing another version of it now. And until there is a energized, active, engaged popular movement, it's going to be hard to combat. If Thatcher and Reagan or their advisors knew exactly what they were doing when they came into office. First thing they did when they came into office, both of them, was crush the labor movement. Mm. That's critical. As long as you don't have an engaged labor movement, there isn't going to be a solid continuing base for progressive programs. So it's very important to kill the labor movement. Now, this was done Thatcher did it by smashing the coal mine strikes. Reagan did it right away away. by bringing in uh, scabs, which is illegal in every country in the world except South Africa at the time. Hmm. Bringing in scabs to break up strikes. As soon as the government did it, the corporations got the idea they started doing it. Uh, Pretty soon you had have what you have now, practically no labor movement. Then, of course, you have the courts which are business run, of course, which institute what are called right to work laws. Mm-hmm. Right to work means right to steal. It means that a worker in a union can say, I want union protection, but I'm not going to pay dues. Mm-hmm. That's right to work. It takes real good propaganda to put the. I mean, you're, yeah. you're in Arizona, which is a right to work state uh, right now. And and if you look at the map uh, back to the Reagan era and, and before, um, so much of this was, was empowered by the Koch brothers, uh, which you know too well. And, and, and I think what's so interesting about their strategy is you're clearly the Republican Party demographics were, were shifting away from them. Um, they had to start appealing to new voters or, or taking control of, of the power. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, through actual challenging of incumbents or uh, controlling the media, astroturfing, lobbying, um, redistricting, of course, later on, it seems like the Democrats, the new Democrats, the establishment Democrats are are operating with the same tactics right now against progressives because uh, the, the demographics are not in their favor, clearly. I mean, the ideas of Senator Sanders, the ideas of, of AOC and the squad and, and so many other uh, progressives that are now rising into power are really reflective of a generation of, you know, millennials and below. And, of course, you know, uh, working people who, who haven't been coming to the polls at, at the rate needing to win. So knowing that they're all, there's all this power around us, you have monopolized media, uh, you know, barely any investigative reporters left, barely any state house reporters left. Um, you know, the parties that are extremely concentrated uh, towards corporate power. How can the progressive left, so many of who are new to this movement because they're younger, really fight off and not fall for the same um, tactics that they, they can fight back against um, moving forward? I mean, what, what, what tips would you have for, for younger people who are now part of this movement? Keep at it. They've already had successes. Now, the uh, 
you know, the the program of the Biden, the Biden program that was compelled by popular activism mm -hmm. to move farther towards what's called the left mild social democracy than any previous program since mm -hmm. Roosevelt. And it was done by constant activism. So for example, on the most important issue of all, uh, the do, doing something about environmental catastrophe, party didn't go far enough, but went way beyond the Clintonites, uh, way beyond. The DNC didn't like it, but were forced to accept it. The uh, program calls for $2 trillion of investment in uh, something like a Green New Deal. It, it supports a Green New Deal, which is essential for survival. And it, uh, uh, it, it even called for advancing the date for uh, net emission neutrality. Okay. Now, the next thing will be to see if they'll do it. It's one thing to put it on paper. It's another thing to implement. They're not going to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. They'll only do it if the same forces that made them write it on paper will keep their feet to the fire and make them implement it. And that's what young people can do. Keep banging at the doors. The, the, how did a Green New Deal ever make it to the legislative agenda? Okay. Sunrise Movement. Right. Group of young people who were not only agitating, but went to the point of taking over congressional offices, Nancy Pelosi's office. Now, they got support from AOC, other young uh, young legislators who came in on the Sanders wave. Now, there was a progressive Democratic senior senator, Ed Markey, he joined in, mm -hmm. and they managed to put it on the legislative agenda. Now, the Democratic Party nominees have been compelled to accept it. DNC doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. But that's the answer. It's, I mean, real politics is not pushing a lever once every four years. Right. That's what they try to tell you. The standard view of politics is uh, you're, take the leading intellectual, public intellectual of the 20th century, Walter Lippmann, liberal, Wood Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy, liberal, one of the major writers on political philosophy. His position was supported by many others is the population are spectators, not participants. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to show up every couple of years, push a button, go home, let other people run things for them. That's the line. It's also the corporate line. Mm -hmm. Corporations are concerned, not just the DNC, Corporations are concerned with what they call reputational risk. They're starting to hate us. They're going to get, they're in trouble. Actually, domination is very thin. It's only by consent. People withdraw consent, the whole thing collapses. And they know it. And so you take a look at uh, the Davos meeting last January. It's very interesting. Every January, as you know, the rich and powerful gather at uh, a ski resort, fancy ski resort in Switzerland, Davos, and congratulate each other on how marvelous <laughs> they are. <laughs> CEOs, the Hollywood stars, media yeah. figures, and so on go skiing. This year was different. Mm -hmm. The theme this year was they're coming after us. Mm -hmm. We're facing reputational risk. We got to do something. So the line that they projected was, uh, we've been doing wrong things. We know it the last 40 years, we haven't been working for you the way we should be, but now we're reformed. We realize we made mistakes, we apologize. Now we're dedicated humanists. You can put your faith, your faith in our hands. We'll take care of you. We hear this periodically. In the 1950s, it was, uh, we're going to be soulful corporations. Yeah. Not just <laughs> for money, we're going to be soulful corporations. Well, we had 60 years of that. Now we're going to be deeply humanitarian corporations. So just 
go home, put your faith in us, mm -hmm. push the lever, go home, be spectators, not participants, and we'll make sure that everything works properly for you because we're so dedicated to your welfare. Well, people can either accept that or not. Mm -hmm. They don't accept it, keep hammering away, you make progress. That's how every positive change has ever taken place. The power doesn't give you gifts. Right. Now they grant you something that they're forced to. Right. When it's taken, when they can't have an alternative. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, biggest bank in the United States, a, a leaked memo appeared, a secret internal memo, a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. It was warning that they have to stop their funding of fossil fuels uh, because it's causing reputational risks. People are going to withdraw from this. Okay, that's the answer. Yeah. Uh, until you manage to dismantle the system. It's, an, it's a system that shouldn't exist, right. but we're not going to dismantle it by snapping a fist. It's going to take a lot of work. Right. Meanwhile, you can force it to accommodate your needs. Uh, just as social democracy developed in Europe, just as the New Deal developed here, uh, just as uh, civil rights developed and women's rights, uh, uh, the environmental movement, the uh, anti-war movement, anything you can think of. So, Professor Chomsky, before before we uh, wrap up, uh, you, you were part of this letter uh, that was addressing free speech, and it was, I think, interpreted in uh, the public as a letter fighting back against what is now called cancel culture. Um, and I'm curious because I know you've had to ask this, answer this question a lot, but uh, cancel culture is, or, or, or the attack against folks uh, for, you know, transgressions, past transgressions, apologize transgressions, or nothing at all, just plain old smears. Um, it seems to be have become a weapon of 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 the powerful, I guess it's always been, but um, we're seeing it, especially in this election, uh, you know, Alex Moore's campaign in, in, um, in Massachusetts uh, right now against uh, Neil, Representative Neil, and we see it with Shahid Buttar against Nancy Pelosi there. And there are many, many other races where um, they're using a cancel culture quote to, to break apart, uh, you know, campaigns, the momentum that they're gaining. Is this new? <laughs> What's happened is that segments of the left have taken up the standard procedures of the mainstream establishment, which are never discussed because they're just what you do to the left, you repress it. But segments of the left have picked it up. It's wrong in principle. It's tactically ridiculous. It's a gift to the right wing. If uh, somebody comes to campus who you don't like, say Charles Murray, and you break up his meeting, uh, that's a gift to him and to the right wing. Right. They love it. They can then portray themselves as the good guys who are standing up for freedom of speech against these uh, radical thugs who want to destroy everything. So if you want to, if you want to commit suicide, it's a perfect tactic. Uh, what you should do if somebody comes to campus who you don't like, is organize a meeting in which you discuss, you bring people together, expose who it is, what the background is, what we should do about it. That drives them off campus in embarrassment because it's kind of like reputational risk. Right. That's the way you do it and it's an educational achievement. Now it's a lot easier to go into a meeting and scream than to take a constructive educational approach like a radical activist would, but just because it's easy doesn't mean it's right. Hmm. Uh, it's kind of like saying, uh, I'm against the establishment, so I'll break a window on Main Street. That's which happens, you know, yeah. uh, to the weather underground. We're seeing some of it now. A gift to the right wing. That's basically what the letter was about. Actually, it was kind of amazing that there was any reaction at all to the letter. Because if you read it, it's so mild. Yeah. There's almost nothing. It should have just been a slight tap on the wrist. Nobody should have noticed it. 
the reaction shows that there really is a problem. Mm-hmm. That's 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 exactly it. It it really pushed people uh, from all sides, uh, whatever you know, the far right, the centrists, um, even the left, and it was. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. It shows that there's a real problem. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, I wish we could sit down and talk for hours. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do so in Tucson in the future. You, I, I am a, I, I'm an alma mater of, of University of Arizona, so I wish I was able to, <laughs> to be taught by you. But um, Professor Chomsky, uh, it's been an honor having you on. Thank you for your commitment for teaching us, and uh, we, we, we hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.